Hello there, my friend. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. We were just chatting so much and we had to push the record button. We're like, oh, I gotta know. get some of the people. <laughs> I know. We actually, we actually got to do this thing. We got to be professionals. So <laughs> I, you know what I realized? I saw on social media that um, it was your 40th birthday recently. Yeah. And it was my 50th birthday recently. So we both had like we had our big, big ones. parties. Yeah. We both had our big ones. And it just made me realize how long I've known you. I've known you since you were a baby. <laughs> since you were like 25, maybe. I was thinking like that. Just, you were on my very first yoga journal photo shoot. Yeah. That was not your husband at the time. Right. So you and Jason were married yet, but Jason had written the article that I was modeling for. And that was, oh my gosh, I was so stressed out. I was so yes. excited. It's so stressed. And it was a brand new world. And you were so sweet and so kind. Oh, and good. I'm glad to hear that. Because I was always very stressed. Really lonely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was always, I was always very stressed in that job. So when, if I ever hear that I, I was not a total stress case, I'm happy to hear that. Um, yeah, I do remember that story. It was so iconic. It was the Bakasana story. And um, I don't even know if Jason and I were dating at that time. I can't remember. I don't remember. He wasn't on the set. So I kind of think if you were. Yeah, I, there was no mention of it at the time. Yeah, so then we definitely weren't because we came out pretty early. We came out. We got caught on an elevator, um, not like making out or anything, but going oh. up to. So we got caught at the San Francisco conference. It was when we first, 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 first got together. Like we didn't even have a full definition for what we were doing. And we it was a San Francisco conference. He he had a room at the Hyatt because he was a teacher for the conference. And um, I was going up to his room after after that, you know, whatever, after the dinner. And we got on the elevator. We're standing there going up to his room. And uh, the owner of Yoga Journal got on the next floor, John Abbott. He got on and he was like, oh, uh, 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 and we had to, and we had to get off on the same floor together. We're like, night, John. OK, well, we're going to have to announce that pretty soon. <laughs> we're going to have to figure out what's happening. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I've known you forever. You've been through so much as a yoga teacher and I just, I'm really proud of you and just like where you are. I watch you from afar and I feel like you have come into your own and that's kind of what I hope we can, we can talk about today. Um, yeah. So you recently started your own whole like channel. I'm just going to call it a channel. I don't know what you call it, but no, I haven't landed on a word for it either, which yeah. my wife jokes is just very apropos for me because nothing I do ever fits into one definition, uh -huh. which yeah. is charming, but really hard when you're trying to explain yourself to other people. Um, yeah. It, House of Phoenix is not, it's not an online yoga platform per se, although obviously we offer a ton of yoga and meditation, but it's, um, it, it's an online community, I think is probably the best term that yeah. I've come up with for it. And it was my moment of like, screw it. I'm not going to create the thing that is trending and the thing that I know that will sell easily. I am, if I'm going to start my own thing and I'm going to have full autonomy, which is so amazing, by the way, highly recommend it. Um, yeah. I'm going to make it exactly what I want to make it and bring all the things that excite me. And that was, mm -hmm. I mean, look, if you're starting a brand new business, I might not be the best person to come to you for advice <laughs> because you know, pursuing everything that you love and offering that is very charming, but not always the most financially feasible <laughs> thing in the world. But the community that we have built, Andrea, it's just, wow. I. And, this, you know, it's kind of the post quarantine world. We're all hungry for community, um, not being able to go into the studios and have that Kula and that community and that connection, yeah. talking with your teacher before. And because that's so much of what holds us accountable, right, is being with our people and loving mm -hmm. your teacher so much that you want to be there in person. And I wanted to try to recreate that feeling as much as one humanly could online because mm -hmm. online can so sterile and mm -hmm. uh, for both sides, right? For the teacher, because you're in a room by yourself or maybe a couple people are filming you. And then for the practitioner where you're in your room and you could easily 
turn my class off. You could mute me. You could anything you right. want. To, you don't have to stay there. Yeah. And the people that have risen from this appropriate word for Phoenix, it's just bonkers. I have this community that I know so much about that's all around the world now intimately. And it's just, we call it our coven and it's the house coven. And uh-huh. <laughs> there's pretty cool magic happening there. Yeah, I know. So I, I logged on and looked around and I mean, of course, the design of everything is gorgeous because you are just such a, such a design maven, which I totally appreciate. I love, I love good design. Um, and, um, but I also, you know, it, like you said, it's noticeable right away that, you know, you're teaching class, like amongst all your books and, and you just look like yourself, like, which I think is more and more across the internet is such an amazing thing that we all get to just look like ourselves now. <laughs> we yes. don't have to like, you know, I don't know. Our Lost shirts don't all have to be tucked in and right. Our hair flat ironed and what, and unless that's what you want, that's totally fine. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, it's noticeable from the look and feel alone that it's it's just a reflection of you and it's like you feeling comfortable um, being who you are and offering what you offer. And I really do also appreciate when you say it's not easy to be someone who doesn't fit neatly into a box, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you feel like, How did that, how did that evolution happen for you? You know, do you feel like you got to a point where you were just like, I just gotta be me. And, 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 you know, um, and how did you figure out when you were creating House of Phoenix, what that would look like? Yeah. Well, (laughs) I, I think it has a lot to do with the pursuit of happiness and a changing definition of what happiness is. Mm -hmm. And so much of my life, I was raised by an incredibly successful driven father who taught myself and my siblings at a young age that uh, doing well in life, finding success will give you happiness. And the more successful you become, the happier you'll be. And of course, that is completely inverted where the happier you are, the more successful you'll feel in your life. And but mm. that was definition that honestly I still struggle with you know even this morning I woke up and I was talking with Kate and you know I'm talking about the logistics of the it's my business I fully run it now marketing this everything you know like I have to be the brain behind it and I don't want to do any of that that's like that's not that that's not what I want to do and it's um it's been a very interesting capitalistic tango that I've been experiencing because that older version of myself which I'm grateful for her because it wasn't for her intense drive and hustle. I want to get to be me right now. So it's not shame. It's just not what, not that, not what I want Mm -hmm. anymore, but trying to figure out how to run a business to make it successful, but be unattached to this concept of scaling that one Mm -hmm. must always scale. One must always grow. One must always bring in more money. One must always more. And then that's that like, think capitalistic injection, because then I am unhappy every day. It is impossible to reach my happiness because there's always something unattainable and I haven't gotten there yet. So Mm -hmm. that kind of tango has been living in my life on many different levels for years now. So I think exposing myself to my demons and listening to them and noticing this makes me unhappy. This makes me happy. This is a bullshit story that I've told myself forever that's holding me in one place. This is what I actually need to do. There's been a lot of that dance going on. And so House of Phoenix, like, sure, I could have launched like a super cheap subscription. All I do is sweaty yoga. You are going to get skinny. I'm going to make your ass round. We are going to cinch that waist. You know, I mean, I could have done all the stuff that it's a thirst trap and pull people in and make the money but then I'm just contributing to what makes me sick. So this was my opportunity to just look at what are the things that I can put into the world that have given me so much joy and happiness that have fueled me, that have allowed me to reassess who I am and house was born. And that's why it's called house of Phoenix. Phoenix is the mythological bird that depending on your myth, every 500 years, every thousand years is reborn from the ashes. But the thing that's so cool about the myth is it's not the same bird. It's not the same bird that rises from the ashes. It is a new phoenix that always rises from the ashes. And I Mm -hmm. love this idea of 
spontaneous transformation on a daily basis and that you come to House of Phoenix because you are ready to transform and you are ready to have all of these different iterations that you cannot be confined, you cannot be contained and that we can culture that and nurture that in our house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, did, I don't think I realized it was always a different bird. I like that too. Nitty gritty, that is, mythological details. Call me when you need them. <laughs> yeah, and the phoenix rising from the ashes strangely um, appears in a lot of children's cartoons. Yes, yeah. Um, and it's so it's been like ever present since my kid has been born, like thinking about that a lot more. And it is like one of my favorite, favorite, favorite um, myths. Um, so there's two things I thought when you were talking about that. The one is that I've been thinking a lot as I, you know, enter my 50s, which is simultaneously crazy and what scary and excited, exciting. Um, and I think it for me, it started actually when I turned 40. Um, I feel like it's very common. I don't I don't know if it's like this for all genders or um, or, or just like women or uh, but um, to feel like the the younger times are we're just pressured and and pushed into like seeking achievement and admiration and then something happens in 40 at 40 and you're like oh i have agency like yes i, I have i get to i get to decide yeah. and i see that for you and i i'm so happy that makes me so happy I do think that's, well, and all the older women in my life have always told me that, right? When you get to your forties, when you get to your fifties, it's the best it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're younger, you're kind of like, okay, lady. I know, <laughs> totally. <laughs> but if I look back, it, even when I look back at my thirties, which was not that long ago now, I'm like, Ooh, I don't want to do that again. I do not need to go there again. And I have, this is another part of House of Phoenix. We do moon rituals and I teach people magic. Um, magic with a K. So like ritualistic magic, not like, Hey, there's a bunny whoop, came out of a hat. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and part of it, so you'll see this on my wrist right now. I have this little uh, twine and you probably can't see it, but there's little tiny knots on it and it's called knot magic. And so it's, there's all these different forms of magic, but knot magic is when you do incantations and each knot, you say something and you're binding the energy into the knots. So Think of it like intention at Surya Namaskara A. It's the same thing, right? But you were doing it through a methodical repetition and incantation. And um, one of my good friends who's in her early 30s asked me to do some knot magic for her. And I was like, okay, you know, handwrite for me exactly what it is that you need, exactly what it is that you want. And I got you. And the letter she sent me and it, I could tell that it was raw and earnest for her, but it was all about success. You know, it was all about career and financial stability and, and, you know, when in achievements and, and I was like, oh my, like, I know that feeling so well. I think I have a letter like that written in my pile too, but convincing myself that accolades, that financial st security, that, um, fame, um, all of it, you know, that, that, that is going to make me loved and that is going to fill me up and, so I took her words and I spun them in a way as a woman of the world at age 40 uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I knew would serve her best in my opinion, but it's just, it is interesting life. You know, it's, I think we're on this quest for wisdom mm -hmm. and yet you have to know that there are just certain layers of wisdom, like in a video game that you cannot unlock until you finish the one that you're in. You just, you mm -hmm. can't. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of getting older. You can see that. And I think you become more patient mm -hmm. with yourself and everything around you because you know that things will unfold as it, the time is right. Yeah. And that's continuously beautiful and frustrating when you can't, um, can, it's hard to convey. It's hard to explain. Yeah. And also when you're in that space, like this woman probably is where like, you know, that it doesn't, it doesn't all feel quite right yet but you like you said you still have to go on your journey to get to the next that's where she's thing. at she mm -hmm. has to be there right now and I mean I could sit there and pour every ounce of experience and wisdom I have into her and it's it, it might like moisturize the surface but it's not going to penetrate right 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 and um, right 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 yeah I think the other thing that is so helpful for this process is having being in a sturdy relationship 
where someone can reflect back to you some truth. And I see you with Kate, and I just want to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, you are you're you guys have been together for several years now, right? When how, when did you get married? We got married in 2018, 17. Okay. 2018. We've, yeah. we've been together for, we're coming up on seven years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Time flies. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so, and, and I don't know Kate personally, but I know she is a smart cookie. Um, and she just, I don't know. She definitely comes across as being like, um, as, be grounded and, 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 and wise. And so how has that been for you to be just in a relationship that feels, that feels right in terms of your growth and in terms of House of Phoenix? I, we look at each other all the time and just say, this isn't normal. What <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're like, excuse me. <laughs> I, 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 it's, but it's not, you know, I, I just, the fact that we found each other um, and the invite, uh, let me also preface this by saying like, we argue, we have our issues. We are yeah. definitely a married couple that goes like this, but the pulse is always like that. I mean, we just love each other so much and she is my best friend and I want the best for her and she wants the best for me. And we have gone through so much in such a short amount of time. I mean, I was, I went through my divorce with her and then her father got sick with ALS and died. And then my father got sick with liver disease and died and, and, and then all the family dynamics. And it was just going from like one thing to another thing. And, and COVID and then COVID. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and so it's, I'm like, okay, you are 100% my human. You are my person. Yeah. Like, we can get through all of this and still love each other we are, this is like solid, but it's, it's amazing because I I've also never, I'd never been in a relationship with someone who related to my level of ambition that we were, we had, when we met, we were at very, uh, very level with our jobs. I mean, she's a sports journalist and then here I am in the world of wellness, but we were experiencing similar levels of success and movement and activity at the same time. So there was a lot of mutual respect. And that helped. And then she yeah. left ESPN and was kind of floating around. And then I've been all over the place. So we've just kind of hold the end of each other's like balloon, <laughs> you know, to not let each other go off too far, but like enjoy the view, but <laughs> tug on it when you need a little grounding. And it's just so wonderful to wake up and speak all of my thoughts out loud and have someone that can stir it and parse it and help pick the goodness out of it and remind me when I am going into my lunacy over what I think I need to do, what is proper. It, it's just, I don't, I feel so grateful. I feel yeah. so, so grateful. And for anyone, it, it, it's also hard to sit here because if someone's listening to this and they're like, well, I don't have a person, so good for you. Um, <laughs> I also learned not to settle. You know, I think that that's another thing that happens is that people are so hungry to find that person and you get tired. It's exhausting. It's exhausting trying to find your person. Yeah. So I think my biggest advice in that realm is like, do not settle the, there. Keep your heart open. Keep your mind open. Mm-hmm. You like, don't write down. This is what my person looks like. This is the degree that they have. This is where they like, come on, give me a freaking mm-hmm. break. Like stop yeah. it. You know, yeah. and just be open and that is huge. That is also yeah. massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't get married till I was 36. Yeah. I I was like, I'm not sure this is going to happen, but I definitely knew that all the relationships I had been in, I felt incredibly lonely. And I was like, okay, I would rather just be alone and be with my friends than yes. be in like tied to this person who at the end of the day, like, or at the beginning of the day, like you said, when you wake up and you can actually relate and connect if you don't have that for me, I, I couldn't do it. Like I just couldn't keep up any facade. It just no, wasn't, wor- wasn't worth it. Tell them all the things. Yeah. And that's something it, I've never had in a relationship before. Yeah. And it, and it took a lot of courage for you because like you said, you had to go through a divorce to get to where you are. So saying, I mean, you're not kidding when you say like, don't settle, like you had to actually make a massive change in your I life. 
blow things up. I mean, it yeah. was a small catastrophic moment <laughs> in time. Oh. Anyone through a divorce can relate. I, I, you know, the whole Gwyneth Paltrow divorce thing, but was it conscious uncoupling? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay, Gwyneth. Um, <laughs> I have yet to have a friend who has been through divorce and it was just cake. Um, but it, it's just, and that's a, another beautiful lesson is that pain is part of life. It's just simply part of life and there's no avoiding it. And so if you waste all this time trying to avoid it, instead of just being in it and experiencing it and trusting that this is not permanent Mm -hmm. and the depression lies, you know, then there is something quite wonderful on the other side. But I mean, it is a slog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. I like that you said it's exhausting. It is. It is. And for anyone out there who, yeah, if you are trying to find a person and you haven't found a person we we know it's it's nobody tells you that nobody admits that that it can be exhausting and you just can't when you're in it it's hard to be like well but maybe a couple months whatever time frame from now that i'll laugh at this but like when you're in it it's the only sensation you know it's the only thing you feel and And that's why we have a yoga practice, right? That's why we have a meditation practice. That's why we have all of these tools to take us out of the unconscious default mode that throw us into the past or into the future with anxiety and fear Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. bring us back into this present moment where we can actually see clearly, even if it's just for a blip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to say one more thing about Kate and then I, then we can, but I just love that. Like I see in her, again, I don't know her, but um, just, I love for both of you that you're both creatives. Like you've both, like you said, you've both had external achievements and been really successful. So you understand the drive, um, but you're both, you both seem very nerdy and creative. So mm-hmm. how much do you nerd out on um, writing and words and books in your life? Like, is that is that a, a focal point of your life and your relationship? If you can see what my computer is propped up on now. It's just a huge stack of books. Um, yeah. Well, we start every day with the New York Times crossword puzzle. So we mm-hmm. start every single day with words. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're both writers and um, we both love to read very different styles of book. Like I run the Inky Phoenix, which is a fictional book club. House of Phoenix also has Professor Phoenix, which focuses more on BIPOC, LGBTQ, yoga, wellness style titles. Um, but uh, this, is, this is actually a great little anecdote. Um, I I've published two nonfiction books, but three years ago, I decided to finally write a novel and I'd mm-hmm. always wanted to write a novel. I'd always wanted to do fiction, but you know, that's the thing I told myself when you're older, when you're older, not now, not now, like that's not what's going to sell for you. Don't do it. And finally, I was just like, blah, fuck it. I'm just going to do it. And so I wrote uh, what we put on the market as a young adult novel. And then the feedback was, it's not really young adult enough. So I went back to the drawing board and whipped it into shape for the adult market, gave it back to my literary agent, and then we put it on submission. And this is like another fun post-COVID thing where like even getting editors to read something is begging, like begging them to look huh. at something. So it's just been floating around in the ether. And I've never felt more out of control with a professional offering in my entire life. Almost everything that I've ever done, if I work harder, if I reach out to more people, if I do something, study more, it will work. Mm -hmm. But with this book, I'm just like, oh my God, I wrote a freaking book twice, (laughs) twice, and I can't do anything to help it get its home. And so I kind of had to bury it for now, just because I can't live my life with that kind of pain. And for my 40th birthday... Um, there's this amazing artist that we love and Kate reached out to him, gave him my manuscript and had him illustrate it like a graphic novel. So he created a cover, he created a cast list, and then he created one page with a panel as if it was a graphic novel. And yes, exactly. Yes. Sobbing when she gave this to me on my birthday, I'm going to like start crying now. And she did that because she's like, babe, this book is so visual. I've always seen it being like a movie or a TV show, like turn it into a graphic novel because I, I didn't grow up on graphic novels. Like I've read Sandman, Neil Gaiman and stuff like that. And she's like, and, and that was her being like, I believe in you. Mm. 
because in the back, I see you, I see your work. So that's not good. And, you know, and she's my wife. She can't tell me if it sucks. And then for her to still push for it and do this. So that's, yeah, like we nerd out. And I just, I love that I have a partner who totally thinks outside of the box and we'll see. I don't know. You know, my literary agent, I think is like, great, a graphic novel. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't think there's much money in that but I'm like yeah graphic novel um so it's just it's we'll see we'll see but the point is she believes in me that much yeah. and it's so cool to have someone see your talent and pick you back up when you're just exhausted yeah <laughs> and tired because it's very hard to keep moving forward without verbal approval like you it, that's we're so hungry for approval and this society is such an approval society so just sitting in the silence without any feedback is very hard very hard i i read something once that um being in a marriage is a lot a lot of being married is about having someone to help witness your life with you yeah and that's kind of what she gave you with that you know she like saw you and saw like i see this work i get it that's just what we want so much is for someone to see us and get us and, yeah. and, and appreciate, right. And appreciate everything. Yeah. yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about like the components of house of Phoenix, because I think it's really cool. And um, I saw, I went in, okay. So you've got your meditation Mondays. Yes. You said you've got the inky Phoenix. Yes. Um, yeah. And so how does it work? Like if you join can you just join the book club or do you like do the yoga like is the book book stuff relate to the yoga stuff how do, how does it all work together fabulous questions Andrea <laughs> um, yeah so I mean there's a lot of wings to the house so there's meditation Mondays there's house yoga so every Tuesday Thursday I go live and teach different yoga practices or movement practices there's Phoenix friends and that's when I bring on guest teachers like sometimes lesser known teachers who I want to give a platform to, and then, you know, Tiffany Crookshank came on every now and then I'll be like, here's a big hitter, pow, have fun. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Professor Phoenix is the wing of House of Phoenix, and that's more educational book club. Inky Phoenix is technically not part of House of Phoenix. That's, I started that a year or two before this, but that's the fictional book club. And then Hungry Phoenix, I do um, a cooking video every month. We're going to pivot for the summer and we're going to do it live on Zoom so we can all cook together. Oh, nice. Um, Gosh, uh, Inky Phoenix Presents is when I take titles from the Inky Phoenix and turn it into a yoga practice, which is really fun. That and is cool. And then mythology once a month, the first Sunday of every month, I pick a myth from around the world and I turn that into a 75 minute class and I rewrite the myth and read it to them at the beginning of class. Okay. So that is the one that I was like, this is so Catherine. I love this. How amazing. <laughs> how, so you, how do you choose how did you, have you become such an expert in mythology? And like, how do you relate that to yoga? I definitely, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I am a massive lover and consumer of it. And I, it's just the way my brain works. You know, I, I obviously could teach a yoga work style, a shtanga style class, like in my sleep. I think Jason and I are very similar in that way where we both come you know, I have Mati and he had Rodney and we both come from amazing senior teachers. And so we can like get in there and give you a great class and no problem. But I, I think the creative aspect of myself, you know, just starts to feel like, what else can I do? And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've never considered myself just a yoga teacher. And not to say that there's anything wrong with just being a yoga teacher. But again, there's, I'm a writer, I'm a yoga teacher. And so I was like, okay, I, I love magic. I love myths. Um, and I had written a class that turned into a workshop a long time ago called the hero's journey. And it's where I took, you know, like 10 different myths from all over the world. And I put them into a workshop and I created little sequences it would just be a sequence like the Thunderbird from indigenous Americans was a little dancing warrior. And, mm. and then I would jump into even go to like Snow White and go to, to folklore. And that would be like tree pose with the poison apples. Mm. But that's what inspired it. But I was like, you know what? I think I've got it in me to write an entire practice dedicated 
to one myth. So when I research, um, sometimes it's, it's really on the nose. Like I did a myth about Hera from Greek mythology and her sacred animals, the peacock. And there's this entire story about Argos the giant and the peacock and how it got all the eyes on its feathers. So I told the entire story about the giant that protected her and the peacock. And, and of course we did peacock pose, but then I think about numbers and I think about feathers and I think about the giant and then actions that happen into it. And so the class will get crafted around all the different parts of the story. So mm. we're going on a ride the entire time. And sometimes I'll pivot it a little bit. It's always different. Um, and Nancy was really fun. He's the trickster spider god from West Africa. And that was so much fun because he had to do all these trickster things. So it, it's just, it allows me, it is exhausting. Like I often sit down. I'm like, why did I do this to myself? Why, why, why <laughs> a lot I of prep, it? right? A whole month. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I write the myth as well. And I do a little PDF that you can download with the class and people wow. print it out and they put it in the little book. It's super cute. Um, so it's just, and it's just, it's who I am. It's what people expect from me now. And I'm just happy to stoke. I want, it's why I started the Inky Phoenix, my book club. I want people to read. I want people to be mm -hmm. curious. I want people to, to get off of their computers and, and, and stimulate themselves. So I'm hoping that through giving them yoga, which I already know is a beautiful offering that if I can stoke their curiosity about a West African spider god that they'll go learn about a different culture too so it's not yeah. just myth they're going to learn about the world and then if you have children then you can go teach your children about these myths that have been handed down orally or th you know through generation 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 and teach us about why we are who we are now yeah um, so it's just been very i i, I love it and of course every yeah. time and I'm like, oh, that was great. But then I'm like, whew, I got another month before I need to figure out the next. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, but I think what I'm gathering is, you know, it keeps your fire burning as yes. a teacher, too, because it's so funny. I was just taking a walk before this interview with a friend of mine, and we were just saying, you know, anybody who's done any career for 20 years, yeah. you get to a place where you're like, oh, my God. I don't want to do this anymore. You just have those moments. You just do. Yes. So it's like you're taking, I think this is, you're inspiring me um, because we can, it's, it's hard. It's hard. We get stuck. And, and also we get fearful about offering things that aren't, that we don't know how people are going to respond. You know, a question that I get a lot when I teach about like creating content is like, well, how do I balance, you know, what, what I really want to write about versus like what people want. They just want poses for me. And I, I mean, my answer is always, I have to do the things that I'm passionate about. Yes. And you know what? They are typically the things that don't do as well. And that's okay. That's okay. I mean, it, it just, like you said, it's like life is not a numbers game. It's just not. I know. In terms Why of your always scaling. Why do we have to always scale? Why? Because we've been told. Yeah. And programmed yeah. into our brains as, you know, if you're American, especially, like it's just. Oh, it's and like, now that now that we see numbers, like through social media, now that we see numbers all the time, so it's dangerous. so hard not to be like, well, I'm not doing anything because my numbers aren't going up. I'm right. like, and the algorithm is always changing and you're like, nobody loves me. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. But really hearing you talk about this is like all I need because it lights you up. It You're excited to do it, which means it's going to be alive and 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 palpable to the people who are, are in like and receiving it love it love it so yeah. much you know like the yeah. and we, moon rituals every new moon and full moon we'll do like just ritualistic movement and i'll teach a different you know uh we'll cast a circle and we last night was a uh, strawberry full moon or not last night a couple nights ago and so i did a love a love spell with candle magic and strawberries and mm, and and fun. you know it, it's so great. And I just, I love seeing what people have to say afterwards and how it helps them. And then like seeing people wear their knots and, and just this it's connection. And I know there's that, you know, kind of 
<laughs> Mati used to always say this and Kate's always like, I can't believe she said that, you know, or Mati would say like, it doesn't matter if the entire class loves you. If you reach one student, that's all that matters. And Kate's just like, oh my God, that's the most tired thing in the world. <laughs> like, maybe I was like a little bit of a starry eyed yoga teacher to believe that, <laughs> but, but there is obviously truth in yeah, like one person is an entire no, life. It is, and it, no, it's really true. And, and when if you if you receive one email instead of a lot of people, mediocrely, new word, um, I'd much rather have a deep impact on a small group than a whatever effect on a large one. And right. even all the mainstream stuff, Andrea, right? It's so vanilla. It's so tired. It's been done before. Like whenever I look at the people who have created empires. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's not, not to mention, not to mention an empire is a lot to maintain. And if you're maintaining it and it doesn't, and it's not true to you, that's draining. I mean, that's draining. It, it doesn't matter how much it's a number game. It's not, it's not going to be, oh, I do this because I love it. That's when it's a number game and you are like reading, you're following the algorithms, you're pivoting just so you can win the game. It's a game. Yeah. 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 So, which, hey, you do you. If that's like, I'm impressed by people who do that, but I do worry that there's just to, there's a certain level of success that I truly believe that you have to sell part of who you are to achieve it. Mm. I just like Hollywood is such a great example. When you look at really successful actors in Hollywood, they have to give up so much of who they are to reach that status. Mm. And from the outside, everything looks glossy and amazing and wow. And we just don't think about the parts of those people that are dead or sad or always feeling empty. Um, like or don't them. have time, don't have time for their loved ones. You, know? you can't. Yeah. You can. And turns out the best thing in the world, like my favorite part of the day is waking up with our two dogs and Kate makes us our oat milk lattes and we <laughs> a crossword puzzle. And it's when I'm my happiest until we eat dinner like sea otters on the sofa and watch Netflix at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> like sea otters. <laughs> I'm glad you we're, we're not the only family that eats on our sofa. We often like, um, we have like a little upstairs area now that has our, has a cozy nook with the TV and, um, it has a couch, but it also has beanbag chairs. And we always like fight over the beanbag chairs, <laughs> including the dog, including the dog fights. Yeah. I mean, when I think about it, um, I, I would say like the, the, the best, and I say that ugh, begrudgingly, but part about having cancer is like a few experiences I had where I had this, like, I mean, it probably was really like my own experience of awakening where it was just, I had this tunnel vision mm. of the only things that are important to me are Sophia and Jason and a handful of other family members. That was it. Yeah. That was it. And it keeps me really grounded now, even, you know, almost 10 years later, it's like the, anything that I'm doing is so that I have that time to be with them. <laughs> and yeah. And the best part of my day is at night when the dog gets like really soft and cuddly. Does Ashley get like that at night? The dog well, suddenly like gets soft. With dementia is that I can hold her and she's like, where am I? <laughs> oh, no, poor Ashley. And she, she falls asleep in our arms a lot now. It's oh. the best part of her being old and she'll just. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, like that, that oxytocin of like being with, with the beings that you love is that's, that's it really mm -hmm. it is <sighs> beautiful chemical reaction actually yeah 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 it takes um it also takes courage to um to be willing to not just from the perspective of um to to do what isn't like mainstream it also takes courage i think in 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 our tradition in particular in yoga i, I don't i wouldn't I don't know how, how this applies to like fitness or other forms of wellness, but, but definitely in yoga, there's a lot of pressure about um, lineage and like staying true to the lineage and staying true. And, you know, I think it's only been in the past 
couple years that I've been like, no, I, I can I can talk about this. I, I I'm not Jack Cornfield, but I I can, I can teach meditation, and it's okay if I can't remember every single sutra all the time. Like I still have uh, value, uh, even though I don't teach in this super traditional way. Um, was that ever hard for you to get to the place of of drawing in other other, you know, drawing in magic and drawing in mythology? And was did that ever did you have to get over a hump of like is it okay for me to do this? Yes. I, I think I've questioned it a lot in the past couple of years, especially as a, a white American woman teaching yoga. I, I, I have straight up been like, I shouldn't teach yoga. I shouldn't be doing this. Um, but I have since obviously gotten over that. And because I do think the thing that matters is respect and respecting the lineage, which doesn't mean you need to teach completely traditional yoga. Mm -hmm. It means that you respect the lineage that it comes from. Like I, for example, I stopped saying namaste at the end of my classes because I've been listening to a lot of educators and I sat yeah. with it and I thought about it and what namaste means. And it was just something that I was told you do. You know, there was so much that I was just taught. You just do it. There's no explanation. This is what we say. This is what we do. And I finally sat with it and I was like, I, I I don't say namaste in anything else during my day. Like if someone would randomly say namaste to me on the street, I'd be like, <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, it's so it just, yeah. it's, so that was a good wake up call for me to, you know, so I find my way of saying thank you mm -hmm. at the end of class to my students. And I mm -hmm. say what I'm grateful for at the end of the practice. And that's my namaste too. So I think for teachers who are struggling with that, it's, respect and then understanding where you fit in and what feels true to you. And mm -hmm. if it burns true to you, like, yes, you teach that. You definitely teach that. And not every teacher, you know, I look at my friend Gina Caputo, for example, who is a phenomenal yoga teacher and one of the smartest people I've ever met. And she knows everything. She knows everything about the lineage. She knows everything about anatomy. And I would, and she just, it's always so passionate. And I would just have moments of like, wow, I will never be able to even touch you with, like, there's no way. And then I would and be like, I shouldn't be teaching because I don't have that level of passion. I don't have that level of knowledge, but I was also given something deeply special from Mati Izrati, my teacher, and she passed it on to me. And I took a part of one of the best teachers who has ever lived. And I put that into myself, but in a place that was also me. Mm -hmm. And, and you just have to trust yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, like I'm, am I teaching traditional yoga? Definitely not. Am I a highly educated human who pays attention to culture and the world and is constantly learning and adjusting my teaching to fit what I think is the most accessible, inclusive thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are many things in my past that if I look back, I would cringe. And I don't think you can fixate on the mistakes that you've made, but focus on this is what will make things better. And just mm -hmm. keep, I always tell my students, be open, be curious, be open, be curious. And and House of Phoenix, one of our ethos is being deeply inclusive and diverse and and something that the yoga world in America has lacked so, so deeply. And, you know, it's baby steps, but I may have wandered away from your original question. No, no, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it's it's it's. um Yeah, it's it's all about being respectful of tradition of lineages of your own teachers and then also of yourself. I think that, yeah, it's it sometimes can be hard when, um, well, for me anyway, I could speak for myself. I care so much about it that I don't want to get it wrong. Right. And it's so special and, too that you want to present it well, because it's, yeah. yeah. But it's also, I'm sure you agree with this. The yoga world is such a divisive community and highly opinionated community. Yeah. And everyone yeah. believes their opinion is the correct one. Yeah. And, you know, 
like I think a good example is when people talk about yoga and yoga isn't an asana practice. Yoga isn't the postures. It's not advanced postures to which I often nod my head, but asana is one of the limbs of yoga. It is the most accessible entry into yoga for most people to move their physical bodies. And for someone who's never been able to access potential within their physical body and be given a discipline that will then show them they can do something challenging with their body is a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Yeah. So yeah. I just think that when we get on our high horses of yoga is this and yoga is not that, and this is not yoga. And they'll like, you know, pull up pictures and be like, this isn't yoga. I'm like, you don't know that. I know. <laughs> might very much be yoga to that person. And why do we have to pit ourselves against each other? I just, yeah. I don't know. And I mean, I've, I've complained about things that it, I would be embarrassed. I, it's just, we just need to be open. We yes. just need to be yes. inclusive and open. I yes. think. I'm with you. We need to be open. We need to accept like the, the missteps of our past and, 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 and look at them and say to ourselves, we did the best with the information we could. Therefore, others do the best with the information they can, right? Be more accepting of where other people are so that we can like encourage them to be open. And then we all just keep learning. We all just keep learning. So totally. especially someone new to yoga. I'm like, oh man, like if all these rules have been thrown at me when I was in my early twenties. Yeah, that's I, true. Oh my, my head would have cracked open. Right. It just been too much at once. And yeah. And it comes back where kind of full circle again is I'm, you know, you're about to turn 50 I'm 40 now. And the things I know now I had no concept of before, nor should I. Of right. right, 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 right. Yeah. I would have appreciated maybe someone like whispering in my ear, like, pay attention to this. Like, don't say that you're going to regret that later. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's how you it's gonna be there forever. The internet will be there forever. Okay, let's end on a note of let's bring it back to like, what is your um, which myth are you covering this month? In I your no. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry, put you on the spot. I need to pick the next one. <laughs> um, yeah, we. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I, the the last myth that I just did was called okay. a um, kumiho which comes from Korean folklore. And it's about a demonic nine-tailed fox that consumes men's livers. Uh, yeah, it's similar to like Kitsune from Japanese. Um, yeah. I feel like if you have a child, you probably heard Kitsune because there's a lot of anime. Um, and a Kitsune is not demonic, but they're crafty and wily and often quite full of wisdom. But um, I don't know, because I also like to look at the time of year and mm -hmm. see if something like I did a Halloween special where I took all sorts of different Halloween e kind of um, myths like the headless horseman and stuff like that. Oh, wow. yeah, um, yeah. But uh, I'm gonna have to figure that out soon because the first Sunday of July is, is it's coming up. It's gonna be coming here before you know it. One day at a time because I offer so much That's each true. week that I can't get too far ahead of myself. Otherwise, I'm in a constant ball of stress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what aspect so and then in terms of the book club i'm is that where people get to interact with you the most um well yes and no so inky phoenix we do a monthly zoom so we all discuss our book together and we love that but professor phoenix the book club that's part of house of phoenix kate fagan my wife is the current <laughs> professor phoenix um, nice. celebrating pride month so everybody is part of the lgbtq community this month um that will be a live zoom where everyone gets to come on and talk to her and it's a community thing but i also open every class 10 minutes early so people can come on there's a little chat on the side everyone has their little avatar and we all just chat i've got my video on i'm talking to people That's so smart. yeah questions and you know just like walking into the studio together and catching up and yeah. people it's so sweet people won't be able to take class but they'll pop in they'll be like can't stay just wanted to say hi oh <laughs> nice 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 awesome awesome yeah. well i'm so happy for you and like i just i'm so glad to reconnect with you and you're just I missed you. happy, so happy to see you doing so well i know i know it's been forever and now it's like there's no more yoga journal conferences to even like bump into 
to, to people we love, but I don't know. We'll figure it out. Jason and I are starting to do more, a little bit more in-person community gatherings and, and you tell know, me how it goes. Have more. Back, yeah. Cause I, I've forgotten how to even orchestra anything like that anymore. Honestly. <laughs> it's taking us a while to figure it out because of that. But yeah, we're just, we're determined. We're determined. We just want to just see people. So yeah. I'm going to try to make it happen. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Please yeah. Do. Yeah. Well, so much love to you and your family. Thanks for being here. Big hugs. Yeah. And, and just best wishes on everything.